Hi, everybody. Today, we are going to talk about the chemistry of everyday life. This is the chapter 15 in our current version of the textbook. And I'm just going to warn you, some of this stuff is um, a lot of detail that you're not necessarily going to be tested on, but I just thought it would be really interesting for you to find out about. And I will really, really emphasize the most important parts for you. So, you know, when you're reading through the book on this, you can get really, really bogged down in a lot of details. And you're probably reading this chapter going, ah, how much of this am I going to have to know for the test? And so I'm going to point out very specific parts that I really, really want you to focus on. All right. But then, you know, a lot of this stuff is just interesting part about being a chemist. You know, that's what people expect you to be able to do when you're a chemist is they can just hold something up and say, hey, what's this made of? You know, because that's what we chemists do is we just know how everything is composed. And you can actually just fire back at them and say, well, actually, it's da -da 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 -da. and your friends will be so impressed and they will wish that they were a knowledgeable chemist like you are. So this lecture will actually help you um, be able to impress your friends. So let's start with cleaning, chemistry of cleaning. Um, the idea behind the chemistry of cleaning is that you can use molecules to remove other molecules from clothing using their chemical properties. And so if you remember back to last week's lecture when we talked about intermolecular forces and we talked about polar molecules versus nonpolar molecules, that's really what's going to be the driving factor here. So some chemicals remove other chemicals and some of them keep them from redepositing. So it just depends on which kind of application we're looking at. So when we're talking about soaps, soaps are special molecules containing both polar parts. And remember from last week, we talked about intermolecular forces. Polar molecules have a positive end and a negative end, just like a little magnet, and nonpolar parts. And when we say something's nonpolar, that means it doesn't have a positive and a negative end. So soaps are special because they contain both polar and nonpolar components. And so they can dissolve both polar and nonpolar molecules. Pretty convenient. So if you look here, um, we're talking about when you see these long chains like this, that's nonpolar because these are all carbon atoms. The blacks are the carbon atoms and the white dots on the side. Those are hydrogen atoms. Carbon and hydrogen chains are always nonpolar. So when you see these, think about big long chains that don't have positive and negative ends. Whereas water, remember from last week, we talked about water has very, very polar. It's a oxygen atom here in the red and it's like a negative on it and the whites on the side are hydrogen atoms and they're like little positives. So when we're looking at soap, soap contains a nonpolar part. That would be this part right here. And then the polar part of a soap, instead of um, drawing it in cartoon form, like down here, it's actually showing you, this is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and another oxygen here, this part's negative and then this part's positive. And we don't need to worry about what this is called in this introductory level class, but just note that this is the nonpolar part and this is the polar part. And so when we talk about oil and water, the famous oil and water don't mix. Why is that? Well, the main reason and the really the only reason that we chemists care about is that their intermolecular forces don't match. I mean, that's really the main reason. The intermolecular forces found in oil are nonpolar and the intermolecular forces found in water are polar. So you'll have hydrogen bonding in water and you'll have London forces in oil. And those two are incompatible with each other. And that's why when you add oil to water, you'll have these layers form. The water says, no way, no way. I don't want anything to do with this nonpolar part. So the nonpolar parts are all facing up away from the polar water. And then the polar parts are all facing down. And so that's what a soap would look like in water. The nonpolar part would be in here in the oil and the polar part would be down here in the water. And so if you take that mixture of oil and water and you just shake it, like you have oil and vinegar dressing, for instance, you can shake it, shake it, shake it as hard as you can. And it might look like they're all dissolved for a few minutes and you go, ta-da, I got the oil and water to dissolve. But what really happened is you formed lots and lots and lots of micelles. And there's actually a really uh, popular makeup product on the market right now, or at least it was a few years ago, called micellar cleanser or something like that. And basically what it is, is it's an oil and water emulsion. You're just shaking it. Um, and anyway, the oil and the water don't want anything to do with each other. They say, no, thanks. And so the micelles form 
when the nonpolar parts all orient in towards each other to get away from this polar water. And so the nonpolar part goes inside, the polar parts are on the outside, and these little guys here are called micelles. And so if you leave this sitting out long enough, you'll get those layers back. Now, if you add soap into there, this is uh, disrupting kind of that, that natural um, tendency to get away from each other. All right, so this is a definition from your textbooks called a colloidal suspension. It's when one substance is mixed into another one and it's um, finally divided throughout. So this is a picture showing a laser going through one without diffracting and diffracting in the other one. Groups of molecules are clumping together into form, to form small particles. And so an emulsion is two substances that normally don't mix. And so a substance that causes one to dispense in another is called an emulsifier. Um, soap, is an, soap is an emulsifying agent. So it keeps things like water. Water doesn't typically want to hang out with oil. They're not friends, but they can cause them to hang out together. Um, mayonnaise is an emulsion, right? Because it contains um, water components and fat components. And normally those two don't want to be friends. But so um, mayonnaise is an emulsion. Uh, the emulsifying agent usually comes from the eggs. So when we talk about synthetic detergents, synthetic just means man-made. And so when you have calcium and magnesium ions from your hard water and they react with soap molecules, you get this slimy soap scum or scale, right? Some your textbook calls it curd. So when you have hard water, Anyone who's got hard water knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you get a lot of soap in there with your hard water, you're gonna get this gummy, slimy stuff. And it'll deposit, it'll make your skin feel like it's not fully clean, especially if you've got really, really hard water. Um, you'll also see it on the edges of your bathtub. And so this is a, a figure just showing you that. Here's your soap, this is the hard water, and this is kind of what you get. And so chemists developed synthetic detergents that don't react with hard water ions. And I'm not gonna ask you, you know, what this stands for, okay? So don't let that freak you out. But I just wanted you to know that synthetic detergents have been made, you know, better living through chemistry is kind of the expression that don't give you those hard water ion effects. So there are ABS detergents. Um, one of the problems with them is that environmentally, you get your fresh water, if they get into a creek or a river or ocean or whatever, it causes it to get foamy. And you may even see that, um, you know, out in, if you're out in the creeks or something, you see a lot of foam. Um, they don't biodegrade. And then the LAS detergents are decomposable over time. And so that's one advantage of the other, one over the other, I suppose. And then here are a couple other detergents. I won't ask you this on a test, but just throwing it out there. So when you talk about laundry cleaners, so you're talking about the stuff you put in your washer um, to wash your clothes, it's a lot of different stuff in there, right? You've got the detergents, you've got builders. These are things that increase how effective your surfactant is. So it softens the water, which is good because if you have hard water, that water softener in there will help the effectiveness and then also keep your dirt from redepositing back on your clothes. You've got fillers, they don't have any cleaning properties other than they're just making the, the solution more consistent and dense, equal density throughout. Enzymes are something that um, we'll talk about a lot in general chemistry sequence. You'll hear about them in the biochemistry sequence. For here in this class purposes, all you need to know is that they help degrade different types of stains like blood and that sort of thing. Um, brighteners are molecules that actually bind to your fibers and make them brighter looking. And then the bleaching agents are oxidizers. So there is a famous um, uh, product on the market that has oxidizer in its name uh, and it decomposes stains by converting them into things that are colorless. So it doesn't, you know, it's not magic. <laughs> You're just converting them into something that doesn't have color. All right, when you talk about things that clean out drains, drain cleaners. So this sodium hydroxide is a very strong base, very, very, very strong base. Um, it produces heat and then aluminum dissolves in that and it helps get your clogs out of your drain. And your toilet bowl cleaners are, are acidic solutions 
and they're dissolving the hard water and carbonates and all that good stuff. Now, this is a fun story I have to tell you. And when I was in undergrad, um, I was a bridesmaid in a wedding and the bride was a chemist. And I was obviously a chemistry student. I hadn't, I wasn't Dr. Brock yet. I was just still me, plain old student. Um, but I was in a wedding and the bride was a chemist and she was a couple years older than me. She was already working on her PhD. And so all of her bridesmaids were all science dorks like us. We we're all sitting around getting her hair done before the wedding. And I kid you not, the bride and a couple of her bridesmaids were chatting about what kind of intermolecular forces we were forcing our hair to form by going through the process of curling our hair. And I said, no chemistry, it's your wedding. You're not allowed to talk about chemistry on your wedding day. So fun fact from my real life. So when you curl your hair, ladies, you can think about this the next time uh, you're working on your hair. Keratin is a protein. And if you go on to take biochem, um, I've got some online biochem courses that I've taught before. Um, you'll talk about it in there, but this is a protein and it is the primary component of your hair. It's what gives it the, the structural integrity in those cells. It's a uh, long amino acid chains and those chains interact with each other through three main ways. I will not ask you this on a test, but just so that you know, um, for future classes, maybe this is interesting for you. You could go take an uh, elementary biochemistry class, which I have taught and I know other people teach too. And so when you curl your hair, what you're doing is you're in causing these um, forms, inter uh, these intermolecular forces to, to get formed against their will, more or less. And so you can cause, um, when you wanna curl your hair or straighten it, you can do that by disrupting these bonds. And I'm not really bonds, they're actually intermolecular forces. And you can do that by, by pH to disrupt it. Or this one right here is called disulfide language. If you wanna interrupt them, then that would make your hair straighten out. And so disulfide linkages are in between actual atoms. Long story short, think about this the next time you wash your hair. Um, there are glands on our scalp that give us a substance to keep our hair from becoming overly dry. And so a shampoo's goal is to remove the dirty sebum from the scalp. And so you've got surfactants that eliminate those residues. Again, not gonna be on the test, just fun fact for your life. You can always think about this while you're washing your hair. And then conditioners contain surfactants that cations are positively charged, anions are negatively charged. So these guys bind to these guys and help remove them. And then if you are interested in dyeing your hair, coloring your hair, um, your natural hair color comes from pigments. And so you can lighten your hair by removing these pigments modifying them, or you can darken your hair using treatments of dye and coating the surface of your hair strands. And if you want to permanently color your hair, you have to do a lot more work, which is kind of like a duh statement for anybody who's ever dyed their hair, right? It's, it's a more involved process if you, you know, just spray something on your hair to go to a football game versus you want a permanent color that's going to have to grow out. Again, not going to be on the test, just interesting stuff to think about because, again, next time you're sitting at a, a beauty salon, you're all getting your hair done for a wedding, you know, you can say, hey, ladies, let's talk about the chemistry of the hair that we're doing right now. And maybe someone in your wedding party will say, no, no chemistry on your wedding day. Skin products are something that uh, interest a lot of us. Um, the dead skin cells are lubricated from naturally occurring oils and the optimum moisture content, according to your book, is 10%. And so this varies based on your environment. And so you can use creams and lotions and sunscreens. And so these creams and lotions are primarily emuls emulsions of water and oil. Again, there's one out on the market right now that I've seen advertisements for, not recently, but I'm sure it still exists, called micellar water, which is talking about oil and water. So you're maintaining moisture and the oil's holding it to the skin and all that good stuff. And then sunscreens are molecules that are able to absorb ultraviolet light um, to prevent it from getting it to your skin, right? So we want to prevent that skin damage. 
And so it can also, you know, just in, in, in addition to producer sunburn, it can cause aging of the skin. It can then also go on to do something in your DNA, which you really don't want. You could form permanent um, changes to your DNA, which obviously would be called cancer. So lots and lots and lots of reasons to always wear a sunscreen, even if you're just milling around in the backyard. And so your um, sun protective factor is talking about how well that sunscreen absorbs the UV light. Okay, cosmetics. Again, not gonna be on the test, just something interesting since this whole lecture is about the chemistry of daily life. They contain a whole lot of things, waxes, oils, pigments, dyes, perfumes. And so I'm not gonna make you know what the composition of lipstick is, but if you're interested, there you go. And so your dyes and your oils, the dyes provide color and your oils and waxes are your base for the pigments. And then, you know, the foundation that you put on first, be your emulsions again, make it more like your skin and smooth it out and give it all those pretty um, shades that you like to make your skin even toned throughout. And mascara, I bet you woke up today and you didn't think you'd be talking about the composition of mascara, but hey, the next time you're putting on mascara, you can think about it. It's a composition, it's composed of soaps, oils, waxes, and pigments. Um, and again, those pigments depend on what color you want your mascara to be. And perfumes and deodorants. So this is kind of fun when you think about it in terms of odor in the brain. There are millions of receptors in your nose for smell. And lots of molecules trigger pleasant slash unpleasant. And also some of your strongest human memories are related to odors and smells. And there are lots of smells, I'm sure you can think of 50 of them right now, that you can't particularly identify, but you know. So you can say, oh, that's the smell of grandma's basement. And nobody else on the planet who's never been to grandma's basement have no idea what you're talking about, right? But there are specific smells that are tied to specific memories. And those memories in humans tend to be very, very, very strong and very, very, very accurate. So you can not be in grandma's basement for 10 years and then you smell something from grandma's basement. You go, whoa, that was in grandma's basement, right? Because you have very strong ability to recognize smells. And so when we're talking about producing pleasant odors and your deodorants and eliminating the unpleasant ones, that's kind of what we're talking about. We're using a little bit of psychology on our side there too. Um, odorless molecules don't fit into receptors in our brains. And our brain's processing center, like I just said, is re it's related to our emotional processing center as well. When we're talking about perfume, boy, you could go make a pretty decent living being a perfume chemist. Um, you know, the ability to smell things well is actually a high paying job. So you can synthesize lots of compounds um, that would either a triggered memories, you know, pleasant memories. So if you're trying to make a perfume that's um, very floral or is related to a certain emotion, whatever, whatever, you can, you can do that. And then chemists who are able to do that very well and then tie their, their ability to um, make it, you know, so that a big group of people smells it and everybody feels happy, right? That's what we're talking about here too. And they're designed to be ex experienced in stages or notes, refreshing, full and solid in the end note. So there you go. And perfumes are 10 to 25% in alcohol. Um, that's what the solvent is. That's what they're being dissolved in. And colognes are a little bit different. They're diluted. So if you're thinking about perfume versus fragrance uh, versus cologne, there's one of the options for you. Again, not going to be on the test, but just really interesting things to think about as chemistry affects our daily life. When we're talking about deodorants versus SD perspirants, if you've ever wondered what the difference is. A deodorant masks body odor, so it's not gonna stop you from sweating, but it is going to try to hide the smell once it's already there. So if you've ever experienced body odor, BO um, bacteria that live in places where you're sweating, um, release unpleasant odors as they metabolize the organic compounds that you are excreting through odor. And you know, your, your skin releases all sorts of waste all the time. Um, I don't know if you knew that, but it does. And so bacteria say, mm, yummy. And 
they release unpleasant odors as they do so. And so some of these contain antibacterial agents to kill bacteria um, and other ones, they just wanna, they just wanna hide it, they just wanna hide it up. Whereas an antiperspirant on the other hand, it reduces the amount of sweating that happens in the first place. And so it actually constricts those sweat glands so that they don't open as much. Okay, now the stuff that's gonna be on the test most heavily is gonna be talking about the polymers and plastics because as a chemist, this is historically significant and it's very, very um, interesting from a perspective of if you're going on to take organic chemistry, you're gonna do a lot of this in organic chemistry. If you go on to take the general chemistry sequence, you're gonna do this in the general chemistry sequence. So I really wanted to emphasize this in this course so that you're prepared for future courses as well. So poly means many. Polymers are long structures composed of individual repeating units called monomers. So if you think about a necklace made of beads, each one of the individual little beads is called a monomer. And when you string them all together, that gives you a polymer. And so these properties vary dramatically um, based on what those monomers are. And so this is a video from my channel um, polymers are made of monomers, so this is an abacus, and if you have them all strung together, that's a polymer, but each one of these beads, that's a monomer, right? So monomer, 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 and then when you string them all together, that's a polymer, okay? So that's important vocabulary words for you to be able to differentiate between polymers and monomers, very important. And so go check out my channel. Um, there are three videos here. These are experiment type videos, but they really demonstrate a lot of these topics that we've been talking about in this lecture. The slime time one, we make a polymer and we actually make a cross-linked polymer, which we're going to talk about in this lecture here in just a minute. The hydrophobic sand is a great video to talk about uh, the intermolecular forces because hydrophobic molecules are molecules. Hydrophobic literally means water fearing, water hydro Phobic fearing. So hydrophobic sand is sand that's been treated with a chemical that is nonpolar. And so you dump some hydrophobic sand into water and you reach in and grab it and it feels dry because the hydrophobic sand doesn't want anything to do with water. So this is a good video to go check out to review intermolecular forces. And then this is a, um, an interesting video that my children and I did about snow when it's warm outside, all ties into kind of this stuff. So plastics are polymers. Um, polyethylene is probably one you've heard of. So when you see poly in front of it, that's telling you that it's a polymer. And then ethylene is telling you, okay, this is a monomer made of ethylene. It is a very common polymer. And so the name tells you what the monomer is. Polyethylene, you look at that and you say, oh, that's polymer. What's the monomer? Ethylene. Okay. So it just looks like a string of carbons and their hydrogens on each of the carbons. So here's the monomer. And then polymerization is the process that links all those monomers together. And now you've got a polymer. And these can go on for millions and millions and millions of monomer units. So polyethylene, there are two types. There's low density LDPE and high density HDPE. And so when you're looking at your plastic bottle and you're trying to decide, is this recyclable or not? Or does my recycling center take this kind of plastic? That's what those letters and numbers on your plastic bottles come from. They are literally descriptions of the kind of polymer or the kind of plastic that we're talking about. So low density versus high density. These are the softer, more flexible plastics. And these are the more dense, tough plastics. So low density versus high density. And you just look at your plastic and then you see which kind of recycling center to take it to, because that obviously determines how it would be processed to be reused. Other, proper, other polymers you've probably heard of are polypropylene. So it would have this carbon chain with CH3 methyl groups sticking up. Polyvinyl chloride, AKA PVC, you know, you probably are familiar with that with um, pipes, polyvinyl chloride pipes. And so that's this backbone with chlorines sticking up, polystyrene, um, AKA styrofoam. These rings are sticking out. You don't need to worry about identifying this for a test, but <clears throat> might be important for you to know is um, the fact that polymers are made of monomers and the the type of monomer that you use determines the polymer that you get and the type of monomer that you use or 
The way the polymer is put together obviously determines the structure. This is a figure from your book telling you there are different recycling symbols. This is what I was just talking about. Those symbols tell you how you can recycle it. And then it also tells you its structure, right? So the next time you're looking at a bottle and you see HDPE, you say, hey, that stands for high density polyethylene. You can tell your friend about it and your friend will just be so impressed. Oh, that's polyvinyl chloride, that's PVC. And I can draw you what the monomer looks like. They'll just, wow, you are so smart. I can't believe that you know that. And this one's just another figure from your book. All right, nylon is called a copolymer. That just means that instead of one type of monomer, there are two types of monomers. And so they're alternating units instead of a single unit that's repeated over and over and over. Um, nylon 66 is um, what we call nylon. And I won't ask you what the monomers of nylon are, but if you need it, if you look at the name co, right? So we're talking about getting together two different polymers, two, two monomers getting together. And then condensation polymers are just molecule, molecules getting kicked out or atoms getting kicked out when they form. That's what condensation polymers mean. And again, that will be a useful unit for you to talk about when we talk about organic chemistry. Because um, when we have a condensation reaction, you'll see that word again, expelling atoms during a chemical reaction. All right, so PET, maybe you've seen this before on a label of some sort. And I won't ask you to draw the structure, but it's condensation because water gets kicked out in the process. And condensation copolymers here. Again, I won't make you draw this on a test or anything like that. So rubber is called an elastomer, which is a polymer that's easily stretched and you can return it back to its original shape. Um, it is a naturally occurring product, but it's now made synthetically, and there are a lot of different variations on it. So vulcanization, that's a fun word, right, is when rubber is made harder and more elastic. And I won't make you memorize this information, kind of Im important for you to know the name. Goodyear, you know, hmm, wonder where that came from. And it's used in tires. So maybe you can explain to your friend the next time you are driving your car, you can say, hey, did you know vulcanization is when rubber is made harder and it's used in automobile tires? Um, what happens here is you've got cross links. So you've got chains and then you've got cross links in between. And if you go watch my slime time video on my channel, that's an experiment that my kiddos and I did, we actually make cross links. And so the more cross links you have in between chains, the more rigid that polymer will be. And so you're getting cross links between chains that becomes um, the rigid and allows it to uncoil, but then return to its shape. And then here's another one, another copolymer. Again, it's in tires specifically, gives them a longer shelf life. And there's a structural view of it, not going to be something you'll need to know on a test, but useful for your visualization. And so here we are at the end describing what we learned and how it relates to the chemistry and how it relates to society. So soaps and detergents are molecules with lots of natures. What that means is they do a lot of jobs, right? And they have a variety of polar and nonpolar components. Um, hair products, we talked about this, breaking and forming those linkages and proteins and curling hair and uncurling hair and that sort of thing. Skin products, lotions and creams, and your textbook left off the polymers section. I feel like that needed to be on this part right here. But the polymers unit is really important to us because that's where we get all our plastics. And we've got plastics everywhere and we use them like crazy. So plastic, plastics are all a um, very important component of our daily life. And so this is where the lecture for this chapter ends. And I hope that this video helped you better understand. And I will see you next time.